Thank you, John, and hi, everyone. Thanks for having me, and especially to the British School at Athens for having me, not just today, but for the residency. And I would also like to acknowledge and thanks and thank um, Jota Pavlidou, who's the archivist at the Konstantinos A. Doxiadis archives, which is um, sort of part of the Constantin of the Doxiadis Foundation and held at the Benaki Museum in Athens for facilitating my very brief research for this very new project. Um, but I, will, I will get into it. Um, please just let somebody know if you can't hear me if there's a problem. Um, but I'll begin my presentation with a bit about my PhD research interests and practice before moving on to brief introductions on Doxiadis and his major project in Pakistan, the new capital of Islamabad, where I am now. I'll then talk about his less celebrated work, which is the refugee townships on the fringes of Karachi, also in Pakistan. So I'll be drawing on my impressions from my time, times at the archives and on work conducted in Karachi in 2016 by my friend, artist researcher Shahana Rajani and lawyer Anam Sumru. Shahana and I are planning to work together um, on a joint project that marries our sort of Doxiadis related research in the near future, COVID willing. Um, so as John mentioned, um, I'm a PhD student based at CRISAP, University of the Arts London, and I'm using the 1947 partition as a limit case for my sonic centered research. Um, I have, I always have to do this and I think um, it's, it's always, <laughs> It's always annoying, but it's always necessary, but to sort of explain what partition is. And the whole point of my research is that it, it's not really summarily easy to explain. But and for those who aren't familiar with the details of the event of partition, I'll give a brief and incomplete overview. So on 14th of August, 1947, British India was split into two countries, India and Pakistan. The populations divided across religious demographic lines. The partition, as it's known, is widely agreed to have been a disaster, with rushed decisions, confusion, confusion and violence marking its legacy. It was the biggest mass displacement in modern history, with an estimated 12 million people moving and a conservative estimate of 1 million people killed in the violence. The experience of women is particularly haunting history. Rape, abduction, honor killings, honorable suicides occurred across and between all religious communities. So many, many people had to start again from nothing after partition. The loss of loved ones, ancestral homes and lands, the division of family, communities and cultures still has obvious ramifications today. It has been compared to in sort of academic terms or, or history books as to a civil war, to a refugee crisis, to ethnic cleansing. But partition, I think, has no point of comparison. Even to other former British colonies and crises in those colonies that were also partitioned such as Ireland in 1921 and Palestine one year after the Indian partition in 1948. So as you can imagine or probably know, the history of partition is vast, contentious, subject silencing, manipulation and omission. So I've given myself a nice topic for, for my PhD, um, an easy one. As at the same time, rising political extremism and borderization today, as well as varying levels of amnesia in the UK, as well as the subcontinent from institutional to state levels, means partition is a complex category to navigate and understand, particularly given the fragmentation of sources, resources and people. However, the gathering of partition testimony is developing at an urgent pace, given the age of witnesses and survivors and has become vital for the study of not just the event itself, but various strands of world history from the angle of the Indian subcontinent. Out of this work, archival projects, including physical archives in some shape or form, have been building up their oral history collections. This uptake in recording testimony has contributed much to how partition is now publicly understood, and that understanding is constantly changing. So these are um, some of the oral archives uh, that I'm planning to focus on as case studies throughout my PhD, although the pandemic has sort of messed around with my initial research plan. So this is kind of, on, this is all changing ongoing, ongoing new ways, um, which I'll talk about later. But my research, as uh, John mentioned, aims to look at the ways in the context in which partition testimonies are selected, recorded, curated, presented, and listened to. My goal is to listen to recordings myself, produced by and for 
various physical and non-physical archives and archival projects. I also hope to interview people engaged with such gatherings of testimony. So rather than interviewing survivors myself, I would, I'm more interested in interviewing archivists, citizen and oral historians, artists, etc. to see how they listen. So partition studies is a huge field and a lot has been said about it already. So I'll end my summary with this. Um, the historian Ganendra Pandey refers to partition as more than just an event, but as a category of understanding. That's where I will start. So I find the historian Ariella Azule useful in my approach to critiquing the partition archive, although it must be said that her context is very different. She was visiting state archives, particularly in Israel, where her Palestinian companion could not enter. So to read the quote fully, the archive as institution assists citizens in forgetting that their citizenship is related to the deprivation of citizenship from others so that they could protect their privileges as rights and demand to fully exercise their right to enter the archive as if it were just a depository of documents open to all. They continue to ask the archive for documents about those who are deprived of this right, as though the archive can produce anything other than propaganda files. So these are particularly strong words um, about the archive. And I mean, there are other writers and historians who I'm looking at now where I think given you know, the, the moment that we're in, I think this question of um, this question of history and silencing has come up um, again. So especially given that the growth of archives that I'm interested in that hold oral histories are often lauded uncritically, taken as history from below, given a voice to people, etc given a voice to those who traditionally historically have not been given voices. I think that the partition archive particularly and its intersections with testimony has so far not been subjected to enough critical study. At this moment in my PhD, I'm considering the partition oral archive as a regime, like Azule says, that precedes and surpasses its physical institution. So it's not just a building. The colonial classification, tagging and naming of different groups in India which is what, which is sort of what I've been on my ongoing kind of reading list at the moment is, is reading about pre-partition India as well as post-partition, um, have for hundreds of years formed human indexes, the differences between them more important than the names or categories themselves. So I think my cursory introduction to Doxiadis, even though it seems like maybe it's not a very connected topic in Athens, um, for the first time opened up my understanding of how such differences manifested in post-colonial Pakistan. So given the ongoing complexities of the historical narratives I'm interested in and the sort of instability of what it means to speak about sound and listening, um, partition as a category of understanding for me is, you know, it's, it's a deeply unstable one. Um, so my research refocuses on partition through the unstable practice of listening in, outside of, and through the archive, not just to the testimony gathered, but also to the context in which these voices are gathered and when. Um, my practice takes partition as a sonic environment, a complex time space that cannot be merely rele relegated to the past and one where listening must be centered. This is a theme applied in my ongoing series, Partition Listening, which John also mentioned. Um, so I'm just going to introduce the two kind of essays, the audio essays that have been done, and the links are there in case you want to listen later. So um, Partitioned Listening 1 is together an audio collage, a counter archive of testimony, as well as sort of essayistic treatise. It includes my grandfather's voice, the voice of my friend Shahana Rajani at a shrine in Karachi, which was a site of the partition massacre, the voice of a BBC presenter from 1977 talking about India, and the voice of researcher Madhavi Menon, who in a fictional sort of turn, positions partition and universalism as characters in a fable. So all of these sonic characters and moments are pivoted around the tale of the British destruction of its colonial records, which began in Delhi in August, 1947 and continued into the second half of the 20th century with Operation Legacy. The second piece also disrupts this idea of time or what Azile calls progressive temporality, where the imposing power of institutional timelines is such that for any narrative to sound accurate, it must be situated historically. Um, 
for example, anchored at the end of a world war or the creation of a state or the establishment of a museum or an archive even. So timelines ensure that events, objects and people are in their supposedly right place, temporally, spatially and politically. So scholars like me can confidently measure changes across time. So these, these essays, I mean, the second one I actually um, finished while in Athens. So it was an interesting kind of experience, kind of being in Athens and, and thinking about these things and not making the connection to Doxiadis. And now I sort of understand and appreciate the time that I had working on these two things in tandem. Um, but both of these essays involved sort of sourcing, recording, sharing and listening across multiple time spaces, disturbing time, as I've already mentioned, and the confidence it, necess it necessitates using the medium of sound and voice. So the works reflect the questions that I've been facing in my PhD. How to listen to history when evidence has been destroyed. How to listen to history that's marked by systemic trauma. How to interrogate colonial categories in the making of time and event. How to understand and reflect upon historical silencing in this way. So juxtapos juxtaposition becomes then a powerful tool for narrating almost collaging together voices and modes of listening. So people's actual memories, post memories, fictional sort of takes on memory, etc. cetera, um, actually became a way to interrogate notions of history. The medium of sound I think can liberate us from certain norms of legibility as Nikita Darwan puts it, particularly in the case of archival voices. Now we move on to the, <laughs> now we move on to the subject. Um, so my interest in Doxiadis, the Greek art architect and master planner, sort of came about by chance. Pakistan was one of around 43 countries in which he worked as a development consultant and planner, being a coordinator for the Marshall Plan aid in Greece and taking part in United Nations and World Bank technical assistance missions as well. He was a consultant to several newly established nation states across the world. In Pakistan, he was supported by the UN and the American Ford Foundation, at one point, Pakistani projects received more Ford Foundation money than anywhere else in the world. So despite his global profile and impact, I only found out about him by chance, as I said, around a decade ago while visiting my family here. So on the right um, of the slide are some of the mounted photos of Doxiadis I encountered, hidden away in an old Hindu rest house in Sedpur, just outside of the city. I learned later that Sedpur village was kept as a kind of model village slash heritage site when Islamabad was built in 1960. So it was sort of preserved outside of the kind of brand new capital. With a temple and Dharamshala, a rest house for pilgrims who believed that the Hindu god Rama lived here for several years. Despite the importance of the adjacent temple, which is centuries old and still standing, Hindus cannot currently pray here. Instead, restaurants and tourism shops and businesses encroach on the land around, which is sacred to this minority community. I found this to be an interesting and problematic location to find a low-key homage to the man who built the city. Around 50 photographs are displayed in the Dharamshala, with no real credits or information apart from these crude captions that you see underneath. So Pakistan was not born a developing nation. It actively became one after it was born in 1947. As Marcus Dashel explains in his book, Islamabad and the Politics of International Development in Pakistan, an army of experts and funding bodies, new international alliances and policy practices formed the discursive context of Doxiadis' work here. The work of Doxiadis in some ways, I think the prolific builder of the urban post-colonial world cannot be understood without acknowledging these networks. It should also be acknowledged that this context, context was also a time of huge change. The population growth coincided with post-conflict rebuilding. It was also a time that immediately followed the end of direct colonization in many parts of Asia and Africa, and the threat of communism to the West, where Pakistan was situated strategically in the middle of the Cold War. International development, as Dashal argues, cannot exist without the void created by the end of empire. This was ushered in by spatial construction, reconstruction, and transformation of the built environment as well as the industrialized notion of consumption and production as a means to prosperity. This is Islamabad, or a sort of old picture of Islamabad because I think there's more kind of mega malls 
now in the skyline. Um, so there's many things like I say about Islamabad and um, it's not really my, my, my interest at the moment, but I do feel like I need to situate it because it, it was conceived by Doxiadis in 59. It was planned from 1959 to 63 and entered the implement, implementation phase in 61. It's known as one of Doxi, as, as Doxiadis' greatest project, replacing Karachi as the Pakistani capital, which I'll say more on later. Adjacent to the old city of Ralpindi, it was built from scratch surrounded, and is surrounded by mountains awash with greenery. Its ordered gridded structure prioritizes public spaces and human scale in a way little seen elsewhere in South Asia. Its multi-modular and linear dynamic growth model is inbuilt to its design, away from the closed city structures that Doxiadis was so critical of. Islamabad's potential to sustain massive urban population growth lay in its achistic vision. Achistics being Doxiadis' science of human settlement, which involves the descriptive study of all kinds of settlements and the formulation of general conclusions aimed at achieving harmony between those who live in them and the physical and sociocultural environments. So this is just to say that he involved a lot of disciplines when he came to his vision of achistics, which was taken from biology, from culture, from philosophy, from architecture, etc. Um, there's a lot written about this if you're interested in it, because I think I can't go into <laughs> I can't go into Doxiadis's um, kind of philosophy too much here. But the plan for Islamabad was laid out in an orthogonal grid of sectors whose size and dedicated number of inhabitants were at the time about the same size as the average or the same number, sorry, as the average ancient Greek city. So the, I saw also in the archive, I saw many parallels between kind of ancient Greek um, settlements and his plans for Islamabad. To quote Doxiadis, the city of the past was in practice is three dimensional one, while the city of the future is four dimensional, the fourth dimension being time. The time factor becomes very important. The city of the past was not growing rapidly. The city of the present and the future does grow very rapidly. This is the reason why we cannot any more afford to keep the center as it was, that is, always at the center of gravity of the whole area. So as you see in the picture of the left, I mean, and this is very much in line with how Islamabad and other projects in, in Pakistan were built, where the, the center is expanding with the expansion of, of, the urban, of the urban grid. This is the Islamabad master plan on the right. So a few years ago, I spoke to architects Fawad and Sahel Labasi for a radio report about the city for Monocle 24's podcast, The Urbanist. They told me that Doxiadis championed public life and this had now been forgotten in the city with its new mega malls, security infrastructure and Saudi funded mosques. Doxiadis's formulation of acoustics was celebrated by local architects, it seemed, for its rationalism and care for society as well as his canny concerns for the future. This matches his vision for other major projects worldwide. The planning for restructuring Baghdad in 1958, for example, was cast in the context of a national housing program. The Detroit area project that he also worked on was inserted into a larger picture of a Great Lakes megalopolis. Likewise, the axial design of Islamabad was supposed to be eventually be part of a network called Ecumenopolis, a coordinated network of cities and natural areas, which Doxiadis thought would cover the entire globe by the end of the 21st century. So Doxiadis' vision is appealing in its kind of almost euphoric modernism and detailed inclusion of human life, life and ways of living, away from the utopian and monumentalist designs of contemporaries such as Le Corbusier. If you fast forward to 2020, Islamabad, with a central mosque for each sector, central shopping markers, park and green spaces for each subsector, seems conducive to the smart lockdowns currently happening here, where small areas can be sealed off in quarantine, but those living in that area can access everything they need without going to a crowded center. I think Doxiadis would somehow be pleased to know that his master plan is somehow working out during the COVID age. I'll just give you a minute to read that. Um, so although this 
concept of entopia was officially coined by Doxiadis in 1966, years after he completed um, his main projects in Pakistan, including Islamabad. It's a concept that stuck in my mind when I started my residency and visits to the Constantinos Edoxiadis archives. The seemingly perfect notion of being in place in a place like Pakistan, which was not only a new country when he was there, carved out of a colonially maintained one, it had to cement belonging and allegiance in the times of crisis and was also based a bit like Israel on strict conditions of who belonged or not. These parameters constantly shifting according to political and geopolitical agendas. It seemed all over the place. And at the archive, I saw that while he was working on Islamabad, Doxiadis was also all over the place, working on many projects simultaneously, fitting a lot into his tight schedule. While Islamabad was near completion, Karangi, as part of the Greater Karachi Master Plan, was also being developed. Optimistic, curious, objective, imaginative, authoritative, open-minded, singular-minded, single-minded, are uh, all kind of contrary adjectives, and, and there, there, are, there are many more that can be used to describe Doxiadis when looking through his notes, correspondence, diaries, reports, and photographs in these archives. I was particularly interested in his diaries, which were incredibly detailed um, notes on his visits across the country, which often verged, which often verged on the anthropological his observations were transcribed. <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. His observations were transcribed from dictaphone recordings, which unfortunately are not held at the archive and are probably lost. Given that at the time there was not in, there was probably no inexpensive technology to store big audio files, and the dictaphone was regularly wiped. The fact that these notes and di for the diaries were transcribed from recorded observations taken at the time, however, reveal an obsessive and sharp attention to detail during his surveys and trips. On the left here, you see kind of how busy he was um, from the contents page of one of his diaries. Um, so this eye for the vernacular and the small scale was astonishing given his capacity for also seeing the very big picture. So all these networked cities sort of that will eventually kind of all connect across the world. However, towards the end of my stay in Athens, I realized that in spite of his extraordinarily multi-scalar view that accounted for nuance in the built and natural environments, his work did not seem to have, at least in the archival evidence I was looking at, did not seem to have any um, accounting for nuanced human subjectiv subjectivities faced at this moment in Pakistan's history. So, in essence, the plan was following the Pakistani state's prerogative at the time. In these urban development projects, inhabitants, um, particularly the shelterless refugees of Karachi, which I will come, come to, were grouped by income with new projects grouped according to community classes. This to me erased issues such as background, ethnicity, time and conditions of arrival, religion, language, and other sort of, other sort of markers of identity. This is aligned with the universal claims of modernist ideologies at the time perhaps, and I'm not an architect, but perhaps people who know about kind of modernist architecture here can talk about that in the Q&A. And I also found it unsurprising in the context because this erasure perfectly fits with the Pakistani state's maintenance of a modern unified singular Muslim nation. So I mentioned before that Karachi was the capital of Pakistan for around 13 years before Islamabad was built. Karachi then as now is known for being incredibly culturally and ethnically diverse. Before 1947, it was a city which thrived on capital and business run by Hindus who left after partition. Its history as a port city predates even the British arrival and the province that it sits in, Sindh, with its incredibly rich culture, legends, myths, storytelling and ancestral lineages is regularly subsumed under the nationalist narrative. So one of the reasons for building a brand new capital away from Karachi stemmed from the problems Karachi was facing in terms of the influx of refugees, who to a certain extent were still coming to the country years after partition and independence was, totally, was supposedly done. Dependent on different visa, visa regimes and policies towards migrants and minority groups. As the economic hub, 
uh, Karachi relinquishing its status as administrative capital was not going to solve these problems fully. So moving the capital to, to Islamabad was uh, essentially an elitist project. So there were no low income housing planned for Islamabad. It was very much intended as an elite administrative political capital um, that didn't need such sort of housing in its plans. So the problems of Karachi were still gonna be there and people still had to be accommodated. Shelterless people, as in those living in self-built homes or slums, needed to be accommodated into the new modern nation state. Sorry, this map is crazy and you can't see it in full, but it's just to give you an idea of the movements that were happening um, in the first 20 years. So this map produced by Shahana Rajani and Asma Sumru is part of the Karachi-based publication project, Exhausted Geographies, um, which I highly rec recommend that you check. Um, and it shows some of the relocations of people that took place in the first two decades of um, Pakistan as a nation. So when um, the Ayub Khan, who we saw earlier smiling next to Dwight Eisenhower, came to power in a 1958 coup, he set out to clear the sprawling informal settlements that had clustered around Karachi's markets, gardens and municipal buildings, ordering the relocation of hundreds of thousands of people to the city's peripheries. Farmland around Karachi was confiscated from rural communities and reallocated for the construction of new satellite townships marked um, on the map with yellow borders. So the most prominent of these was Karangi, a showpiece of the regime funded by American aid and designed by Dr. Yadis. So this is an excerpt of an oral history conducted with Kurangi resident Hamida Bano in 2015, and I'll give you a couple of minutes just to read it. So as you can understand here, um, just from the short excerpt, um, people, some, uh, many of the people who were moved to, to Karachi's satellite towns had experienced multiple displacements. First in 1947 to the country of Pakistan, and second to the new housing planned for them, sort of a decade or more later. The violence of this displacement is clear in not only what she says um, in, in terms of like the content of the words, but the sound of the original interview which is in angry Urdu and punctuated by Bano's tears. In the archive, it's a different story, of course. Um, in marked con contrast, the documentation of the Kurangi project, which entailed 3,000 acres of land around Kurangi Creek being cleared, housed or intended to house around 30,000 shelterless refugees. The aim for it was to also house um, sort of higher income people uh, in the near future as industry would develop around the area. The project was publicized as the largest mass housing initiative in Asia, funded by the International Cooperation Administration under the US State Department. It was also the largest slum clearance of its time. So the Karangi pilot project was necessarily incomplete. Its gridded plan, which was similar to Islamabad's, left open-ended in the sense that houses were left unfinished and there was possibility for the grid to expand for new constructions. This instilled a kind of self-help attitude on the part of its potential residents. The refugees who moved in had to pay for the building, as Bano mentions in her interview, and also finish building their houses themselves. Government press releases celebrated Kurangi's neat and tidy row houses, its promises of stability and modernity also repeated in the press. These obscured the fact that many of the residents arrived to mass manufactured con concrete shells with inadequate water supply and few transport connections back to their workplaces in Karachi. So there was a joke uh, sort of in, I was, I sort of heard this anecdotally, but there's a, there was a joke that basically if you lived in Karangi, 
if you grew up in Kurungi, you didn't know what your dad looked like because he would leave so early in the morning and come back so late at night after work. Um, sewage facilities and electrical connections would only arrive years later as the area transformed into an industrial hub. The idea was that as their income would increase, the houses would grow, but the reality is that the houses did not grow. In 1963, the government attempted a round of evictions after blaming the failure to conform to the plan on the people. As a response, almost 150,000 residents of Kurungi hoisted black flags on their houses to mark a black day. Seven years into the start of the scheme, it seemed that the failure of the plan was obvious, but the people were blamed for it, of course, claiming that they were not making payments or conforming to the design. So as Dr. Ijlal Mutsafad says in an interview um, with Pakistani newspapers and news in 2017, Dr. and his associates framed Kurangi as a continuously expanding refugee settlement. To quote him, this produces the figure of the refugee who is forever settling and becomes a way for the state to claim that the nation is forever settling. Incompletion of the plan itself becomes a way of justifying power. So the word refugee in Pakistan is the English replacement for muhajir, a term used to describe Muslims of different of multi-ethnic origin and their descendants from various regions of India who settled in the newly created state of Pakistan after the partition in 1947. So both sides of my own family are technically muhajirs as well because they, their, their origins are on the other side of the border. Um, Pakistan must be the only country in the world then where refugees are also citizens, but only seen so completely if they speak Urdu, the national language. As Dr. Muzaffar says, settling Urdu speaking refugees became a national project. Settling them was like settling the future of the country. But to end my talk, um, I think this Athens residence has this, sorry, that my residency in Athens, even though it was sort of cut short and I had to quarantine, I couldn't do interviews and recordings as I wanted to around the city. I couldn't meet the Pakistani community there. Um, there were also people who had kind of had connections to Doxiadis who had been to Pakistan, who I was interested in talking to. So all of this stuff couldn't happen in the residency, but I really hope to come back and kind of do ongoing work on this. Um, but it did, it was a really um, amazing time and it, it raised many questions of, for me, mainly relating to the idea of a parameter. So the thresholds of the archive and what we deem truthful in it, of the time it holds and the time it doesn't hold, and of the visible and structural markers of modernity that we deem to be worth remembering, connecting or studying. Um, the residency also helped me to question my own timelines and push partition as a category of understanding in different directions and time spaces. Because of this, my own dreams of Intopia keep expanding. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>